When we're done with this video, you might think I'm being ironic by saying quick guide to our tour, because it's going to be a little bit more in-depth video. This is the second video. If you haven't gone back and taken a look at the one for our itinerary, uh, then please do. The uh, sort of the Alps overview, Alps itinerary overview, tells you where we're going and what we're doing. This one's all about sort of what we're going to do when we're on the ground there. Some expectations regarding everything from uh, our accommodations to safety to some basic information about how to change money and all of the kind of logistical things that you need except for packing. Packing deserves its own video, okay? And that's going to be the third video that you'll see here. Once you've gone through the itinerary and this one and then the third video, you're all set uh, and we'll tell you uh, what you need to do at that point, okay? Um, so uh, this is our quick guide to the tour and I'm going to start with an overview, a little bit about my philosophy and our honors program's philosophy about travel in a nutshell. We're there to learn about a different culture. Most people who go on these kinds of things, that's exactly what they want to do, but it, you'd be kind of surprised. There are a couple of people who say things like, well, I don't understand why this country is not more like America. Uh, I've seen people get off the airplane and look around and say, gosh, look at all the foreigners here. And I'm want to gently remind them that, hey, uh, you're, you're, you're actually the foreigner here. Um, but it's all about exploring a different culture. Expect it to be different. It's not going to be the same. That's what you're going for. Um, we're guests in these people's countries. They won't do everything the way we do things. Um, we chose to go there. We didn't choose to stay home. We chose to go to a country where they do things a little differently. Maybe their laws are different. We have to be considerate and polite in terms of being a guest in the country. And I want you to get out, if you can, and meet other Europeans, not just other tourists. Um, get out and chat with local people, strike up a friendship, say hello. Um, uh, you'll find that there are an awful lot of very friendly people. They're quite used to Americans, and uh, you'll make some good friends, I hope. That would be the, the idea. But be willing to take the good with the bad. Sometimes you learn more from the bad experiences than you do the good. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we won't have any bad experiences, but there are the occasional glitches. Last year, we had, uh, we're had we driving down the highway with our in one of our buses, and we had a blowout. Um, and we had to hang around and uh, wait for uh, the guys to uh, change the tires. Some of the some of the guys uh, in our group actually helped out a little bit with doing that, uh, but we were kind of inconvenienced for about 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes we, uh, we run into glitches. Maybe we run into a little weather problem. Um, come at it with the right attitude and you're going to really enjoy it. Something is probably going to happen in terms of a wrinkle or two in our plans. It's going to, okay? We have nearly a hundred people and we're going to go through several countries uh, and across a couple of different continents. Something's going to happen that's going to kind of slow us down or give us a headache. Be ready for it. Have the right attitude. Hey, you know, it's a pain, but this is this is going to happen, and we're going to get through it and have a good time no matter what. So if you come at it with the right ap attitude, and especially if you come at it with the attitude of, I'm here to learn from these people and from their country and to learn as much as I can and to be a great guest and a great ambassador for the United States and maybe Texas also and Texas Women's University, that's the way to go ab about it in my opinion, and you really enjoy yourself a whole lot more. Word of caution about group travel. A lot of people have traveled on their own, but not a lot of people have done a lot of group traveling. And especially if it's been a while since you've done group traveling, then you have to kind of think about it for a moment. It can be frustrating and difficult unless everybody really sort of shares the same approach. And uh, and that means accepting the fact that we have obligations to one another. We're obligated to treat each other with respect and courtesy, obviously. And that includes, in my book, being punctual. Being pu being late is, is just frankly rude, because what you're doing is you're wasting a lot of other people's time. I don't mean to be blunt about it, but it's true when you think about it. If we're there waiting for one person to show up, everybody in the group is wasting time. If we wait 15 minutes for one person, that's 15 minutes of time that everybody else could have had free time, relaxation time. They could have, you know, grabbed a snack, gone to the restroom, whatever. Um, that one person cost everybody 15 minutes. And when you multiply that across nearly 100 people, that's a lot of time. That's nearly three hours worth of human free time that got wasted uh, spread across our whole group. So we want you to be punctual if you can, right? Um, and that means, for example, when we say things like, hey, uh, we're going to meet back at the bus at 5 o'clock. That means that wherever you are in the city, make sure you know how long it takes to get back to the bus and that you leave however many minutes it takes before 5 to get you there 
at five or even a minute or two earlier. We don't want to bite into your time. We want you to get all the time that you can on the ground doing the things you want to do. But but you have to think about it and um, uh, and be mindful of the time and be mindful of where you are at all times so that we don't hold everybody up. We're pretty good about doing that. Once you'll see, once we get into a rhythm or a groove on it, you'll see that it works really great doing that. Um, uh, we're obligated to be reasonable in dealing with changes, minor inconveniences, and cancellations. Uh, we once had our flight delayed by an entire day, and so we had to spend an extra night in Madrid. That can happen in weather circumstances. We hope that doesn't happen with us, but it is going to inconvenience us if that happens. We're obligated to follow the direction requests of our group leaders and tour director. Um, we will have actually two tour directors, Chris Morrison and his wife Lourdes, uh, and we've been working with them for years and years and years. They're wonderful, trustworthy, absolutely stellar people. I wouldn't travel with anybody else. And we're going to have a set of group leaders as well, and everybody on the tour will be assigned to one of the group leaders' small groups. Okay, So uh, I'll have a small group, Beth Yelverton will have a small group, Josh Adams, Andy Phillips, uh, Dr. Burns, uh, Dr. Busel, Dr. Brown, Gretchen Nur, all of us will have small groups. And, and uh, when we do our little head counts, it's easier that way because if uh, you're in Dr. Litton's group and I've got 11 people, all I have to do is count 11. And when we're there, I can tell Chris or Lourdes, we're, my group's here. And then we count off which group is missing which people. And it's a great system. We'll explain it to you a little bit more fully at the airport. But um, it works pretty well. We haven't lost anybody yet. Um, so uh, we're obligated not to engage in activities that could put ourselves or others at risk or bring disrepute upon our university. And, you know, this is, um, many people who are watching this may not be, um, you know, college age. And that's fine. You might be a mom or a dad or a relative or something like that. So I, 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 that, that's, a, that's a pretty rare thing when grandma's out doing, you know, uh, you know, fan dances at the local Hofbräu house. Uh, but but um, just just be mindful of that, that it's really important that we not engage in any kind of activity that would be dangerous or that would put ourselves or other people at risk. And also that would bring disrepute to our university or our honors program. I'm a big believer in making a good impression overseas. I think Americans kind of get a bit of a bum rap. I think most Americans who travel overseas are very wonderful, polite, warm, um, genuine people, uh, but you get a couple of people that kind of act like louts, and uh, that's not good. So we're, we're certainly going to try to change that perception, especially about Texans. The people love Texans, and we're going to keep that up. We're obligated to obey the laws of the host country, even if we disagree with those laws. You know, in the United States, we have certain laws that protect our liberties. That's not true in other countries. I'll give you an example, sort of a search and seizure law, um, where you say, you can't search my bags without probable cause. Well, in some countries in Europe, they certainly can. So, um, comply with law enforcement when you're required to do so. Always check their ID to make sure they really are law enforcement, but if they are, then you can assume that they're making a, a lawful request of you. That doesn't happen very often, okay, but I'm just trying to get you ready for that. Biggest problem with group travel, as I said, is that people are not punctual. Um, and I talked about the 15-minute waits. Um, if the group is ready to depart and you're not, you will be left behind. And we'll be asked, you'll be asked to find a way to get caught up with us wherever we are. Uh, I have done that before. Not very often, but I have done it before. Other people have planned, sacrificed, saved to be on the tour. No tour company, tour director, or group leader can allow a single person to disrupt the experience for everybody. It's just not fair to them. Emergencies can and do happen, and we'll help. We'll try to help you in any way possible. But you have to be certain to be punctual at all times. So now this doesn't. I mean, if you're sick or there's an emergency, we're going to be there with you. Okay, we're not going to say, well, we're just going to leave you behind. We would never do that, and we haven't done that. So this we're talking about somebody who's just not being attentive. Um, another note, personality conflicts sometimes arise. It's your responsibility to try to resolve any disputes with other group members in a reasonable and calm manner. If that's not possible, then you need to come and consult with me or one of the other group leaders to find a good solution, uh, and we'll make every effort to, uh, to, to help you out on that. But please don't ask the impossible, like, I don't like this person, please send her home. Uh, well, you know, can't quite do that. But we can see what we can do to help you, okay? We want you to have a great time. We want you to enjoy this this excursion and, ha and learn a lot. We really do. And so if there's a personality conflict, just come, come, to, come see one of us. We'll diffuse it as quickly as we can and try to get everybody to get along with each other. It doesn't happen often, but it can happen sometimes. Um, if you look at the fine print of our travel company's material, there is a clause that allows the group leader uh, and the tour company to evict any person whose behavior is unacceptable. That person will be sent home immediately. This has never happened, but I have had instances where students have come kind of close. Uh, things that will get you evicted are uh, include, but are not limited to, violating the laws of the country we're in. 
theft, uh, creating a hostile environment for others through acts or words that are racially insensitive or that single out others because of ethnicity, gender, religion, color, or sexual orientation. Most of you people are just wonderfully decent people. You wouldn't do any of this, I know, but I have to go over this. Uh, physical violence, please don't hit anybody. Um, excessive or illegal consumption of alcohol. If you are under 21, I have a sort of don't ask, don't tell policy. The university's policy is um, if you're under 21, you're not supposed to be drinking, even over there where it's legal. Uh, my policy is the university's policy, but my, my personal policy is if I didn't see it, I'm not going to go downtown looking for you and trying to catch you drinking. But please do not walk through the hotel lobby with a bottle of wine if you're under 21. Please do not you know, order whiskey and vodka and everything when we're sitting down at table together or when we're out together because then you put me in a position of saying, okay, now I got to report this, okay? So I'm, I'm not going to be the personal morality police, but I am going to enforce the university's uh, policies because I'm required to do so as a university employee. Okay, Most of you listening to this may not even be under 21, um, but I, I have to say that. Possession of illegal drugs, failure to cooperate with reasonable requests of the group leaders or tour directors, failure to cooperate with appropriate law enforcement, inappropriate public behavior, we'll just leave that to your imagination, um, violation of the terms and conditions form. Everybody was required to sign off on a terms and conditions form and you, you all turned those in and everything. Again, these are the sorts of things that just almost never happen, but they have happened. A couple of things have happened that have skirted these kinds of things, and we've dealt with them. But if, if it's an egregious example, we do reserve the right to send you home. And that's at your expense, by the way, not the universities. Uh, what do you bring? Let's talk about happy things, not, not, not you know, negative things. Um, as you pack, I've got another video here we're going to do later about packing and all of those kinds of things. We'll go into much greater depth. Uh, remember that you'll be carrying your suitcases through airports and hotels, and they'll be getting heavier as we go. If you're a shopper, they're going to get heavier. So you need to kind of do some thinking ahead of time. The rule of thumb is to lay out everything you think you need and then put half of it back. Uh, that's kind of an exaggeration, but I think that uh, the best policy is um, to have, plan on having one checked bag and one carry-on bag. And inside the checked bag, I like to put um, just a really thin, lightweight, nylon, zip-up kind of gym bag or whatever. And what I do is, you know, when I wear my clothes and, uh, and I've got dirty clothes, dirty laundry, I put it in that little nylon, uh, flimsy little gym bag. Okay, and uh, I, th that means that I'm wearing clothes, I'm emptying out my checked bag, and I'm putting those clothes in that little nylon bag. What does that do for me? It allows me to put things that I may have bought into my checked bag so that I have room in the checked bag, right? So I, for me, I go over there with one checked bag, and I come back with two bags, right? I come over, go over with one bag, I come back with two. But whatever you do, however, whatever your system is, you need to be very, very, very mindful that um, they are very strict on the size as well as the weight of the bags. Uh, when you get the airline information, we'll tell you which airline to go to and find out what that is, because they love to upcharge you if you're a little bit over on either one of those, size or weight. The main thing, though, is if you can't carry all your bags at one time by yourself, you're carrying too much. Don't bring giant-sized things. I'll get into this with the packing uh, thing. You know, be very careful. Nearly all U.S. airlines allow two check bags and one carry-on, not counting purses. That does not count purses for international flights. They do not charge you for checked bags if that if you're within that uh, for an international flight, even if you have a U.S. connection. So you will not have to pay that. Check bags can be no more than 35 pounds, and the dimensions should fit within the airline guidelines, which you'll get a little bit later on. Here's my advice. Like I said, um, bring a carry-on and a check bag uh, inside the carry-on store, a uh, small foldable uh, empty duffel bag, like I said. Um, some things that you want to make sure of when you do your packing. Make sure that you have IDs on all your items, including the carry-ons. Make sure you have locks on check bags. Use the TSA sorts of locks. Go to the Walmart or Target and get a TSA lock. That's a lock that nobody but the TSA can get into. They have the ability to get into it so that they don't have to break your lock, but that other people like thieves can't get into it. It's kind of a nifty thing. Um, make a list of all the contents in all your bags and keep it in your purse or your wallet. Your luggage is your responsibility. I mean, it, it you cannot leave it under unattended. If you do that at a public place, the police may come. 
and say this is we're going to confiscate this bag because we don't know whether you know if it's terrorism or not. European buses have storage for one suitcase and for one carry-on per person. Uh, we're going to be very full, and we need you to keep these very light and very compact. Uh, believe me, if you forget something when you get over there, they've got these places called grocery stores and pharmacies all over the place. Don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. We'll have plenty of stops. We'll find a way to get you what you need. If you say, oh, I forgot you know, my toothpaste or whatever, we can get you that. The hotels frequently will have some of that. Um, but we'll go into that a little bit more later as well, like I said. Carry-ons have to fit under the seats, and they're very small. Um, don't try to fill a second bag until we're fairly well along on the trip if you can. European Europeans dress up a little bit more than Americans. They don't go around in yoga pants and sweatpants and things like that. So you're going to probably want to have at least one nice set of clothing when you go out in the evening because eh, you get some stares. Um, the big criticism of Americans is that we dress like slobs. Uh, we're kind of looked down on a little bit. So don't don't perpetuate that stereotype. Some money details. Um, spending money. You're going to need money for the following sorts of things. Lunches, cab fares, bus pairs, fares, subway fares to places that are not on the itinerary, admissions to places or events that are not on the itinerary, gifts and shopping, any postcards or postage, and an occasional dinner if you want to go out to someplace special that's uh, now. Now, our breakfast every morning is continental, lunch is always on you, and then dinner is always included. Um, I tell students to estimate mm, $25 to $30 per day minimum is what they need. Okay. Now, um, a couple of other things that are money related, and we'll talk about changing your money and things. Uh, once you've contributed to our tip fund, and it is $85, if you've not done that, you need to contribute to the tip fund. I believe we've got almost everybody contributed in. The reason we do the tip fund is because our tour directors, our bus drivers, our local guides, all those guys get tipped. They make their living off of tips. Um, and so if they don't get tipped, they really don't eat. It's kind of like the U.S. here with waiters and waitresses. It's really important part of their income. Otherwise, you're really kind of stiffen these guys. So what we do to make it easier is everybody contributes the same amount to the tip fund, and then we bring that money with us. We disperse it among the tour, uh, the, the group leaders so that if one of us gets mugged, we don't lose it all. Um, and then we make sure that the group leaders uh, have a plan for tipping all of the relevant personnel that we're dealing with over there, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. But do contribute to the tip fund. If you don't know how to do that, call the honors office at 940-898-2337. There's a way to do it by PayPal, uh, or you can do it by um, check by mail if you want to. Um, restaurants and cabs are likely the only other places you're going to need to tip, but not much. Tipping in Europe is not like the U.S. Tipping is not always expected, except for the folks that I was talking about with our tip fund. When you go out to a restaurant or a cab, it, or use a cab, it's really not expected that you're going to tip the same amount that you would in the U.S. Tipping is not always expected, and when it's done, the amounts are not that large. So generally, so for example, if I go out to dinner and I have a $9 lunch or a $9 dinner, I'll just leave a 10, right? I'll just do that. If, I, if my cab fare is, is uh, 4 euros, then I'll, I'll round it up to a 5 and let them keep it. But it's not it's not outrageous. It's not crazy stuff, right? I might not even tip a euro on a $4 cab ride, but um, uh, but it just, just a little bit. It's usually done just for politeness. It's just kind of good manners to do it, but don't go crazy. It's not 20% by any means. They'll think you're nuts if you do it, okay? And you're wasting your money because waiters get paid a very good uh, hourly wage. They don't they don't rely on the tips. Um, on getting cash and carrying cash, uh, any good bank or Visa MasterCard will allow you to take money from an ATM. You have to have a PIN number to do so, however. You want to make sure that if you're using a debit card that it is connected to your checking account, not your savings account. And if you have not yet contacted your bank or your Visa MasterCard company, um, you want to make sure that you get a newly issued card that has the new chip and PIN technology. That's the phrase you want to use, the chip and PIN technology, not just the magnetic stripe on the back. Everything in Europe is changing over to that now, and you're going to need to have a card that actually uses that technology. I do not bring American cash with me. Not much. I bring a little bit, but not much. I use my ATM card. I don't own a credit card, believe it or not. Uh, I use my ATM card, and my, my bank is Point Bank over here in Pilot Point. So um, I've been able to get all over the world using an ATM card, Point Bank, and, and I pay very few fees. 
Um, and um, I don't have to carry a bunch of cash when I do that. Sometimes I will carry a lot of cash, but um, I don't I don't need to because I can get an ATM just about everywhere you go in Europe. You can get an ATM. If, you, if one of them doesn't read your card, then go down a block and use another one. It's perfectly okay. But I do not bring big amounts of American cash because when you go over there, you will get totally, totally hosed when you exchange it at a kiosk or a bank. The, the exchange rates are horrible. Your best exchange rates are with your ATM card or your Visa or MasterCard. Why am I not mentioning American Express? Because a lot of places over there, they don't like it. They don't like dealing with American Express. It's very cumbersome. The fees are very high to the vendor. Um, and if you try to use Discover, a lot of them, a lot of them will just kind of look at you and scratch their heads and say, what's that? Okay, so Visa, MasterCard are the things. Never use traveler's checks. They're a dinosaur. No one wants them. No one uses them. Okay. Um, sometimes ATMs are down. Sometimes if we're in the countryside or a small town, you'll need to make sure you hit an ATM before you leave a big city. But it's perfectly okay. You can guesstimate what you need and uh, you'll be fine. Um, some good pieces of, to, of advice to follow no matter what. Start off with at least some U.S. dollars in cash. Oh, 50 bucks, right? Maybe. So you don't get stuck. If we get stuck at a U.S. airport and you know, you're, you're, you're out of money or whatever, then you can go grab a sandwich. Never let yourself go below about $20 worth of the local currency. Don't do traveler's checks. Um, when you're purchasing uh, a, a, a gift or a meal, uh, try to use your debit or credit card. You'll get the best exchange rate and you won't use up all your cash. Um, spend as many of your coins before you leave Europe as possible. When you get to changing euros back into dollars, no bank, no kiosk, no change machine, nothing will take your coins. So if you come back with a big old pocket full of coins, guess what you have? A very heavy set of souvenirs, okay? But you may like the coins, I do. Um, but when we get to the airport, you know, if you got a pocket full of coins, go buy a bunch of chocolate and magazines or whatever you need to um, to get you on, the, on your way back over. Just realize that, that uh, and by the way, the coins are just, there's like eight coins. We have a penny, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter. They got twice as many of them. It's amazing how you can say, oh my gosh, I'm out of money. But then you look at your coins and you count it all out and you've got like 30 bucks worth of euros just in coins alone. So it'll surprise you a bit. Never leave your money in the hotel room. Uh, and whenever possible, use a money belt or a neck wallet. If you don't know what that is, you need to go out and Google that real quick and get yourself a very good money belt or a neck wallet. Um, you must carry all of your valuables, credit cards, money, passport in a money belt or a neck wallet. You, you mustn't carry these in your purses, and you mustn't carry your purses any way other than what I call bandolier style, which is in your front. That core area from your neck down to your knees in your front, okay, and from one side of your torso to the other, that, that space right in there um, is a very, very important space. That's where all valuables must be. It should never be behind you. It should never be below your knees. It should never be on your back. It should never be around your shoulder. Um, that's very, very important to, uh, to maintain your security with that. Some exchange information. Currently, the uh, U.S. dollar buys uh, takes about $1.15 to buy a euro. we got a great exchange rate going on right now. Uh, it's almost one-to-one, -one. Um, and uh, it is just about one-to-one -one with the Swiss franc, so you won't be too terribly off. If you see something that says uh, 10 euros, think like, man, eh, 12 bucks. Um, if you see something that's 10 francs, think 10 bucks, right? So it's not going to be hard at all. A um, little bit on the value-added tax. If you want to look it up, you can do that. This is for people who are buying large ticket items. If you buy a large ticket item, it, the Europeans include the sales tax in the price. So you don't pay sales tax in Europe. Uh, in addition to the price. When they ring you up and something is 100 euros, there's not 8% tax that goes on top of it. The tax is already built into the cost of the item, which makes the math easy. However, the law is that if you have enough in terms of VAT, value added tax, which is their sales tax, on, on a big ticket item and you want to get that back, you actually can get that back. First, if you buy a big ticket item, ask the vendor to refund that or do the paperwork to do that at the store at the point of sale if you can. If you can't, see one of your group leaders when we uh, get ready to leave Europe. Save your receipts, save everything, and we'll walk you through how you do that when we get to the airport going back to Dallas. Um, there's some different ways that you can do it, uh, and there's your information there. You'll get a voucher and those sorts of things. It takes forever to get it back if they have to mail you a check, uh, so that's why you want to try to do it at the point of sale so that they just instantly credit back your credit card if that's what you're using. Um, uh, the airports, some things about the airports. Generally speaking, when you arrive at an airport, you go through a fairly standard process. You're gonna, uh, when, we, when we get to Europe, we're going to get off the plane, 
go to immigration where they check your passport, then we're going to go pick up our bags, and then we're going to walk through customs, and there won't be a soul there because no one cares that when you're just arriving in a country like Europe, they're not even going to check your bags or anything like that. They really don't, not like the U.S. Uh, if you're arriving at a European airport, you're not going to have anything to declare because you just got there. You didn't, you know, you, you didn't buy anything, so um, it should be no big deal going in. Given today's concern with security, you must absolutely not bring anything in your luggage that could be construed as a weapon. That's things like screwdrivers, believe it or not, things like nail clippers. Now again, you can put some things in your check bag, but you can't put things in your carry-on bag like that at all. And certainly nothing that looks the least bit dangerous, or you're going to get us all stopped, and that's going to be a big, big time waster. Okay? When we're coming back, we'll navigate you through the customs process. It's very simple. There's a little bit bigger step now that they've put some kiosks where they have to uh, have you do that. I just found that out in Miami this past summer when I came back into the country and it took a lot longer because of the you know, the, the new layer of bureaucracy. But we'll guide you through that. It's pretty easy. Some things to keep in mind. Um, customs officers have the legal right to search anything and everything that you have, including your, per your person when you come back into the United States. You're not legally in the United States until you get through customs. You're in limbo land until they give you the go and you walk through the customs and they say, yep, you're good to go. You must declare any merchandise in excess of $1,000 that you purchased or were given. On the first $1,000 above the $1,000 limit, there's a 4% tax above that amount, but not to exceed $2,500. The rate varies, etc. The main thing is that if you don't buy it more than a thousand bucks worth of stuff, you actually have nothing to declare. Nothing. Okay, you don't have to declare anything. It's only if you buy a bunch of stuff that you have to declare. And by declaring, it's not illegal. It just means they want to make you pay the tax. So my advice is, you know, keep your purchases under a grand, and uh, otherwise maybe kind of uh, pack something in, you know, some other body, you know, get, a, get a buddy who, who will uh, put something else if you're slightly over in their bags. You ha If you must declare, pack declared items separately to save some time and save all your receipts. Items that are bought in duty-free shops means absolutely nothing. It doesn't mean you don't have to pay taxes. It doesn't mean you have to. You, you can't. You, you don't have to declare it. None of that. So duty free shops are kind of a rip off anyway, in my view. Um, don't rely on shopkeepers at all for correct information about what you can or can't bring back. They do not know the law. They are not going to be there with you when you come into LaGuardia and the customs guy says, what the heck is this? Uh, don't do that. Um, so check with me. Check with any of the other group leaders. We'll give you some advice on it if you need to know it. But we're going to guide you through that re-entry process very carefully the night before. Okay. Uh, a few things to be mindful of. Only individuals over 21 may bring back alcohol. The maximum uh, without tax without no tax, oh gosh, oh gosh, double negative, the English professor here, um, is one liter. That's it. So also, uh, you can't bring back any prohibited items, things like that, drug paraphernalia, anything like that. no meat products, not allowed to. Fruits and vegetables, not allowed to. Um, bakery items, sometimes cheeses and other foods, anything that's prepackaged from a grocery store that aren't fruits and vegetables and meats are probably fine. Things like chocolates are okay, uh, bakery items, stuff like that, it's perfectly okay. You can't bring back Cuban cigars, you're not allowed to. The only time you can bring back Cuban cigars is directly from Cuba now. Um, Dr. Lytton didn't realize that and accidentally brought a couple back when he went from Spain this past summer. Uh, lucky I didn't actually get nabbed for that. I had no idea. I thought it was perfectly legal. That's why I say you got to really read up on things and don't ask the actual guy at the uh, convenience store that sells Cuban cigars in Spain because he doesn't know the law. Um, but uh, things of that nature. If you want some more uh, information, check the uh, certainly check the link there uh, below and uh, read up on it if you want to. Okay. Some tips on traveling in Europe real quick. Uh, the weather is going to be sort of highs in the 40s to 50s. It's chilly. We're up in the mountains, right? Um, lows at night, usually in the 30s. I wouldn't think it would be in the 40s unless we had a warm spell. So in the, in the 30s, maybe even lower than that. Uh, Europeans use the 24-hour clock, the military clock, right? So they will say it's 1435 when it's 235 in the afternoon. Uh, most of the shops are open in the morning, and then they take a little bit of a, a break frequently uh, and, and then reopen in the evening. Uh, Europeans in, our, in that part of Europe don't really eat really big breakfasts, so be ready for a rather light meal. We're talking cereal and uh, pastries, um, maybe a little bit of cheese, coffee, juice, donut, fruit, 
something like that is what you're looking for. Most of the taxis are fairly inexpensive. They're, they're very reliable and very trustworthy. We will not overcharge you for the most part. Um, and uh, when I, I like to sometimes take taxis simply because if i got three or more people, you can split the fare, and it's pretty good. Um, many people there will speak English, uh, and so you don't have to worry too much about it. We'll tell you a little bit more in terms of safety tips when we get over there. When we check into a hotel, you always want to get the hotel's card, and then you want to write the cell phone of our tour director or group leader on the back of it. That way, if you get stranded, you can just show a cabbie the card, and he'll know where to take you. And if you really get stuck, you can pull over to a policeman and say, I need to get in touch with my group, and they'll help you out. Okay. Uh, taxis charge a little extra sometimes for weird things like luggage, but most of you won't have that problem, I don't think. Uh, some more tips. Cell phones. T phones. Make sure you contact your cell phone carrier to find out what international charges will be like for you. Do not come back to a $900 bill uh, waiting for you, right? If you want to buy a phone card, it's kind of hard to use them these days, but you can buy one, and EF's phone cards are, are very good. They're very usable. I would not recommend getting one from Sam's Club or something like that. They just don't work very well over there. They're hit or miss. Um, a few other things, always, always, always call your bank and your credit card company to let them know that you're traveling about a week or two out from when we go, okay? Because they could put a hold on your card. If you've never been to Austria and they've got somebody over there making charges on your card, they're going to think it's, it's, it's a scam. So you've got to call ahead, make sure that they know you're traveling and where you're going to be going and, and get it all preset so you don't run into a snag. It's hard to call when you're over there to try to get them to do something because the times are different. Violent crime in Europe is very rare, especially the parts of Europe that we're going to. Uh, theft is more common, but violent crimes are very rare. I don't. I, I, as long as you're being safe and doing what you should be doing, you're, you're, you'll probably be just fine. Um, we're sort of uh, uh, a little surprised sometimes at Europeans' acceptance of things like prostitution, sex shops, stuff like that. Uh, they're not terribly dangerous, although they may be somewhat distasteful. Um, uh, just be kind of careful when you're traveling. But our rule of thumb is that you really should not travel in groups of less than four uh, if you can after after dark. Um, it's just a smart thing to do in case somebody gets injured or hurt or gets sick. You need might need help getting them back. The postal service very reliable in that part of Europe. You're not going to have to worry too much about it. Sometimes it is worth shipping something back if you've bought something that's bulky. Right? Uh, it's going to cost you, but it's it, if you're willing to be patient and pay the price, then you can do that. Big department stores usually will do that for you if you ask them, but it's a little bit on the pricey side. So those are some basic tips, and uh, our next video, I'm going to go over packing in particular because it's uh, a major concern for some people, and um, make sure you tune in for that one as well.